And joining us now with pleasure is former World Cup USA winning coach Tony DiCecco. Tony, welcome to Toronto. Welcome to the Coaches Conference. What brings you here? Well, I had an invite from Anthony, and um, you know, Toronto's a great city, so it was an easy decision to come up here. And actually, it's warmer here than it was <laughs> in my home in New England, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Tony, let's talk about some of the points you brought out there today. And I'm interested in one point specifically, technology in today and what part it plays. You and I got to watch a bit of the Canada-USA game last night. You mentioned a couple interesting things that I didn't even notice, but you noticed. USA players had heart monitors, if I'm not mistaken, and Canadian players had GPS units. Let's explain first the heart monitors of the USA and then Canada and the GPS. What are they there to be used for? All right, well, the heart monitors will, will measure, um, you know, heart rate, where the maximum heart rate for a player is, what the average heart rate for the first half and the second half with. So it's a, it's a measure of fitness and where players, where their anaerobic zone is, where their aerobic zone is. And so it's, it's something used to uh, develop players physically and let them know where they can go. The GPS is a little bit more, GPS also has a heart monitor, um, but it also has a unit that tracks the player all over the field. And what it does is it has six zones of running. The top three zones are the ones I used to use. Uh, moderate running to high intensity running, high intensity running to sprinting, and then how many sprints a player has done. And the sprints are generally um, calibrated by that own player's sprint speed and it's calibrated to like 90% of that sprint speed. So if they can do that, if they can hit that speed for one second, it'll measure as a sprint. So now you can see how many sprints your forwards are making, uh, how much distance they're covering, what's the percentage of high intensity running. Um, and it's a great way, again, to uh, develop players in certain positions and uh, create mobility in players and even kind of create a little bit of a competition for players. If you're playing a 4-4-2, you can kind of measure the two forwards and say, you know, this player, player A had, you know, 35 sprints, you only made 25 sprints, why do you think that is? And you don't have to say it's wrong or right. Believe me, he or she will make more sprints the next time. The game has changed in the last 20 to 30 years, Tony. You and I both know that. You better than I. What advice, what tip would you give out to the young coaches in Ontario and in Canada that they need to get better at? Is it maybe going out to conferences like these? Is it getting out more to see veteran coaches in action get some of their experience? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of everything. Yes, you want to come to conferences like this. Look, I'm a presenter at this conference, but I'm learning. I'm taking notes because we learn from each other. Um, you want to um, get to a conference and see other coaches working, whether it's in a conference or in their own team setting because every coach has different ways of inspiring their athletes. Some coaches are pretty tough like a drill sergeant. Other coaches kind of uh, draw it out of them, ask questions, get the players to choose to play a certain way. Um, but the great coaches, it's not necessarily about X and O's. It's how they get the best football out of their players and um, so that's always something good to look at and, and then when you come to conferences such as this you kind of get some of the cutting edge things that are being done but if for young coaches coaches that uh, are aspiring to you know evolve as coaches you know they have to understand that we are usually pretty good at teaching technique we're usually pretty good at teaching tactics you know, physically we can get our teams fit, but there's new levels of physical training and monitoring. And then the mental skills piece is incredibly important and needs to be addressed. Tony, you spoke to me and you spoke to many parents today on one point when you talked about when you're addressing the players after a game, after a practice, and I'm a parent and in the back seat of my car, I'll ask my son, so what did the coach say? Tell us what you think needs to happen in that situation. Yeah, well, my own youth club, the club that I founded, um, you know, we tell the coaches that after a game, if they're going to have a player meeting, and they don't have to have one, but if they're going to have a player meeting, make sure the parents are there also so that you're talking to the players generally it's like hey this is what we did really well this is what we need to improve on here's what you need to do to recover especially if they're playing the next day but the parents hear that so now when the parents get in the car they're not saying what did the coach say because kids don't want to they don't want to discuss generally the game after the game they want to do whatever they're going to do next and um, you know we don't want parents kind of drilling the players on what the coach is talking about 
A couple other points, and we'll let you go. We know that you're a busy guy. But another point that you brought up about was, uh, you know, all players are treated fairly, but really they have to be distinguished uh, from certain different ways, as you explained. Some might have great fitness ability. Some might not. Some might have great finishing ability. Some might not. Talk about that component and how you handle that player that maybe doesn't have all that energy or maybe doesn't have all that finishing but adds in other departments. Yeah, well, you brought up two things there, Anthony. What I tell uh, the players is I'm going to treat you all fairly. doesn't mean I'm going to treat you all the same. So you treat them fairly, but it might not be exactly the same for this player as it is for that player. And the second thing is when I look for, when I'm building my team, I look for players that have exceptional qualities. They might have a deficiency, but they have an excep exceptional quality. So say uh, a player is a great header of the ball. Okay, that player is going to win head balls for us. Now, they might not be as good with the ball at their feet. All right, I'm going to put somebody next to them that is really technical and can really play make with the ball at their feet. And so I'm building that team by trying to get players with exceptional qualities next to players with other exceptional qualities. And hopefully the players have more than one you know, special quality. And rather than just find players that are kind of you know, vanilla, and they're okay in a lot of different capacities. We see in North America still, unfortunately, especially in, in Ontario and Canada, that size matters. And I don't think some of the youth coaches, not all, understand that it's not all about size. Talk about how important it is today that those youth coaches, when they see a player that maybe not might have the height of the other, has a lot more to offer, whether it's from the heart or from the skill ability. Yeah, another great question. I mean, look what Barcelona did. Now, they're kind of getting exposed now, like on set pieces, but for five or six years, they were the best team without question, and they were a lot of short players and a couple of decent-sized players because they were quick, they were technical, they were committed, um, they were fit, they had all these other components. And look, you know, soccer and football are, you know, a game that you don't have to be a giant to play. Some of the best players that I've ever played, Pelé, Maradona, Cruyff, and we can go on and on, Messi, they're not giants, they're just special players. So um, be conscious of that when you're picking players, and especially in youth areas, because the best player in a youth setting might be because they're physically more advanced than the other kids in their age group, so they're just better. And I, I have four sons, and one of my sons was a man-child at 12. You know, I mean, he was just a stud at 12. And so he was the best player, but didn't mean that at 16 he was still the best player. So that, that kid that, and I had another son who, who's now 22, and I think he's finally become a man physically. And he was always a real technical player. They all are going to merge at different times. So don't discount that smaller technical player because in two or three years, they may be the best player on the field. Very last point. Uh, I got to bring this up because I think it's vitally key. You talked about it. Cliques. Let's talk about the cliques the parents build within a youth team. When half of them hate the coach, the other half love the coach. How do you take care of that problem? I mean, let's be honest. All of us have experienced that, whether as parents or as coaches, that uh, there's a split. Well, you know, it's clicks, whether they're the players' clicks um, or whether they're within the uh, parents, generally are not healthy for a team because some unhappy parent, unfortunately, youth soccer, is going to rally three or four other parents and look to take their players to another team. And it's, it, it just creates a lot of uh, ill feeling. And I don't think they're doing their, their son or their daughter any service because that's not how you have to survive in the world, not just picking up and going to somebody else. Look, I, in youth soccer, there's a phenomenon now, at least in the States, where I can't yell at this player or I can't bench this player because if I do, it's going to make her angry, going to make her parents angry. She's already being courted by two other clubs, and all of a sudden she's off to another club. So I have to kind of coddle this player. And then they get to a certain level where the coach isn't coddling anymore because... You know, they're at a professional level or international level, and this kid, and I've had these type of kids, just is not a positive force on the team. They have to learn at an early age that not everything is going to go just the way they want, and they shouldn't just pick up and go to another team because they're a good player and they can do that. Sometimes you got to make it work in the environment where you're in because that will make you a better player down the road. 
Tony, you're a fountain of knowledge. We're so happy to have you up here in Toronto, Canada. Keep up the great work. You're a legend in North America. God bless you. And again, keep up the great work with the youth now in Connecticut. All right, thank you, Anthony. And you too. You keep up the great work you do. Pleasure. That is Tony DiCecco, World Cup winner with Team USA.